Hello and welcome to your weekly dispatch. We start with the top news from Pakistan. Political turmoil rears its head in Pakistan, where former Prime Minister and popular political leader Imran Khan was arrested on Tuesday on charges of corruption, leading to violent protests and widespread vandalism of both military and civilian government buildings. This level of unrest has not been seen in Pakistan's turbulent political history for many years. The Islamabad High Court had earlier ruled the arrest as lawful, while the Supreme Court of Pakistan on Thursday struck it down as illegal and directed the Islamabad High Court to hear the bail petition immediately. As we record this story, Imran Khan has been granted bail in the case pertaining to the Al Qadir Trust. While the government claims that the law is being followed, supporters of the former Prime Minister see this as an act of political victimization by the ruling PDM coalition and the military for Imran Khan's criticism of the military's role in politics. The sitting Prime Minister of Pakistan, Mr. Shabazz Sharif, taking a stern position on the violence, said the terrorists and elements who are enemies of the state should immediately desist from their anti-state activities, warning that the miscreants would otherwise be dealt with with an iron hand and given an exemplary punishment. President Dr. Arif Alvi, in a carefully worded tweet, showed his deep concern about the current situation in the country following the arrest and manhandling of the former Prime Minister, as well as the loss of human lives that occurred as a result. While he acknowledged the right to protest, he emphasized that it should be done within the limits of the law. Scores of political leaders from Imran Khan's party, Pakistan Tehreek e Insaf, and thousands of protesters have been arrested. There have also been reports of a number of people killed as a result of the government crackdown. Khan has been booked in more than 100 cases since his ouster from the government in April 2022 by a vote of no confidence. Many of his supporters believe that the charges against him are politically motivated and aimed at suppressing his voice. The international community, including the UN Secretary General, has voiced concern about the situation in Pakistan and called for all sides to refrain from violence, respect human rights, rule of law, and democratic norms. The ongoing unrest in Pakistan is a cause for serious concern, and it remains to be seen how the situation will develop in the coming days and weeks. In other news, a Pakistani trailblazing startup, Patient First AI, has won big at the Harvard President's Innovation Challenge 2023. The healthcare startup aims to develop a digital health card to store, analyze, and monitor a patient's health records all in one place, making it easier to share with physicians, pharmacies, and labs in developing nations. The founder of the startup, Fiza Shaukat, expressed her gratitude for the recognition and said that it reaffirms their belief in the potential of their platform to improve healthcare access for millions of people in developing nations. A thing to ponder as the educated class flees while Pakistan grapples with poly crises including volatile political and economic climate, as well as a distrust in state institutions, what future does Pakistan have? We'd like to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Moving on to the region, the recently concluded trilateral summit between the foreign ministers of Pakistan, China and Afghanistan renewed their commitment to strengthening trilateral cooperation under the Belt and Road Initiative. They also announced plans to extend the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor CPEC, to Afghanistan and leverage Afghanistan's potential as a hub for regional connectivity. The meeting highlighted the significance of ongoing projects such as CASA 1000, TAPI, and Trans-Afghan Railways to boost regional connectivity and promote economic development. The three parties emphasize the need to advance both hard connectivity in infrastructure and soft connectivity in norms and standards. While the trilateral summit is aimed to boost regional cooperation, China's ties with the West continue to deteriorate. Just this week, China expelled a Canadian diplomat from Canada's Shanghai consulate to reciprocate a similar move earlier by Canada. China claimed that its designation of Canadian diplomat Jennifer Lynn Lelon as persona non grata was a reciprocal countermeasure against Canada's unscrupulous move. Hours earlier, the Canadian foreign minister announced that it would expel Chinese diplomat Zhao Wei over an alleged intimidation campaign. According to Canadian media, the campaign targeted the Canadian politician Michael Chong and his next of kin in China over the politician's criticism of China's treatment of the Uyghur Muslim community. Meanwhile, the joint comprehensive plan of actions between world powers and Iran remains in limbo. 
The deal, signed in 2015, was unilaterally withdrawn by former U.S. President Donald J. Trump. Despite the efforts of the Biden administration to renew the deal, it is nowhere near being renewed, owing to the reluctance of the U.S. administration to lift sanctions that Iran considers vital to move forward. This overall scenario increases the possibility of a nuclear-armed Iran higher than ever before. The U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan has stated that the Biden administration will not rule out all actions necessary, including Israel's freedom of action. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has also doubled down by announcing that Israel is ready to fight Iran on multiple fronts and prevent them from establishing terror fronts and obtaining nuclear weapons, stating that Iran is responsible for 95% of Israeli security problems. This statement follows the launch of Operation Shield and Arrow. However, statements like these may further intensify Iranian defense against the West and Israel. Finally, to Iran's close ally, Russia. The Russian President Vladimir Putin spoke at the Victory Day Parade in Moscow, claiming that the world is at a turning point, with a real war being waged against Russia. He tried to connect Russia's invasion of Ukraine with the struggle against Nazism in World War II. The parade was smaller than usual due to security concerns. Meanwhile, the EU Commission Chief Ursula von der Leyen marked Europe Day in Kiev, Ukraine and discuss the bloc's support for Ukraine in increasing grain exports and sanctions against Russia. The Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky expressed his country's desire to join the EU and stated that Russia has been launching more attacks on Ukraine to present something to its military and political leadership. We hope that this roundup was useful for you. And if you like our content or have feedback on how we can improve, leave a comment below and don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Until next time, I'm Hajra Asaf Khan and this was your Weekly Dispatch.